Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for kids and others. And I see there's a bunch of questions here saved up from uh, previous times. Um, let me see, there's a question here from Alexander asking about experimenting with multi-way hypergraphs and so on and, and physics as a hobbyist computational explorer. Um, well, let's see. So, so what he's referring to there is uh, all the things that we've been working on in this project to find the fundamental theory of physics um, and uh, where, in which we've been having just magnificent success over the last, uh, um, um, the, uh, uh, Um, excuse me. Um, which we've we've had uh, kind of magnificent success over the last year or so, and um, there's a question of what, uh, uh, how can how can one sort of get involved in that? We've been live streaming a bunch of our internal uh, working sessions and so on, so you can kind of see see what's being done. In terms of doing it yourself, the full formalism of our physics project is a little bit daunting. Um, in a sense, anything that is going to be operating at a level so far below what we experience, so far below sort of our ordinary notions of space and time, it's sort of inevitable that that's going to be a bit abstract and a little bit hard to, hard to kind of wrap one's arms around. So you can perfectly well run uh, the Wolfram language code that makes hypergraphs, which are our representation of the content of space, the content of the universe, and updates them and so on, but it may be a little hard to understand what's going on. Um, it's, it's hard for us to understand what's going on. We, it's sort of the upper limit of our kind of both computer, in, uh, computer experiment intuition and mathematical prowess to understand what's going on. So what I would say, if you want to kind of go in this direction, the best thing to do is to start getting intuition about how computational systems work because the computational systems we think underlie actual physics in our universe are in a sense more abstract than the ones that are easy for one to get one's, one's, one's brain around, so to speak. But the ones that are, there are ones that are uh, sort of easy for us to understand roughly what, how the thing is set up, even if it's difficult to understand what it does, the ones that we're using for physics are even hard for us to understand how they're set up. So I would say my, my favorite type of systems to study are cellular automata, where you just have a line of cells, each one is black or white, and then in a series of steps, you just update the color of each cell, depending on the color of a cell above it and to its left and right. Um, and by setting up rules like that, you end up finding, and this was my big surprise in the early 1980s, that even when the rule is very simple, and even when you started off from just something like one black cell in the middle of a, an array of white cells, you can end up with these very complicated patterns of behavior. And so a good place to start is by just experimenting with those kinds of things. And that's trivial to do in Wolfram language. There's a, just a function called cellular automaton that lets you do that. And I think a good place to start is just explore some versions of cellular automata that perhaps have been explored before, perhaps haven't been explored before. There's, what's amazing about the sort of computational universe of possible programs is it's an infinite collection of possible programs and even rather simple programs, we've only got a tiny distance in exploring what they do. So it's rather easy to kind of start seeing things that people haven't seen before. The, the difference between a cellular automaton and the kind of thing we're using for our models of physics is that in a cellular automaton, there's a rigid array of cells kind of laid out in space and progressing with time. Whereas in our models of physics, once just dealing with these sort of points that exist and these connections between points, and there's no pre-existing notion of space. And there's also in a sense, no pre-existing notion of time. In a cellular automaton, every cell is getting updated in step at, 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 at each time step. Whereas in our models of physics, it's like all these different places in the universe can get updated separately. And that's what leads to these kind of multi-way graphs that correspond to different paths of history, leads to quantum mechanics, things like that. 
So I would, I would start with cellular automata. That's where I started 40 years ago. That's how I kind of built up the intuition to be able to try and do these things in our physics project. Um, then once you have some intuition for that and you have some familiarity with how to use kind of the computational tools and visualization and so on for that, then uh, there's a, on the web and uh, wolfhamphysics.org website, there's a tutorial about how to use the computational tools that we have for studying the physics project that's probably the next place to jump to, or possibly the technical introduction to our project that I wrote uh, last year is a, is a long and fairly uh, fairly step-by-step -step description of how these kind of models of physics work. Let's see, there's a question here um, from Gisnoesis. How could one convince the scientific community that they have inadvertently accepted a false result when the bug, when the mistake is subtle? That is a good question and very pertinent to these pandemic times. I mean, many things that people have believed in this pandemic have turned out to be not quite right. And some of those things come from areas of science where people should have known better, and some come from areas of science where one doesn't yet know. So for example, one example uh, where I don't know how many people in the scientific community have really claimed this. It's a very weird claim. The claim, oh, you should wear a mask even if you're outside. This claim is bizarre because if you work out, you know, how much, uh, if, if you're in a room, there, are, there can be little virus particles that, that are on droplets and so on that can float around the room and can even stay airborne in the room for hours, potentially, if there's not much airflow. But if you're outside, what you have, the little piece of air that is near you is mixing with the whole atmosphere of the earth, which is just completely huge. And it has the feature that the, um, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, concentration of virus just goes way down incredibly quickly because it's just carried around sort of randomly in the atmosphere of the earth. So of course, if you're standing right next to somebody and you're, you're breathing at each other, then it's a different story. But as soon as you're kind of out, not in a situation where you're specifically concentrating um, kind of uh, water droplets or whatever else, then you're in a situation where you're mixing with the whole atmosphere. And it's the, the number of, of trillions and trillions of, of, uh, of factors that are involved in kind of the dilution of anything is just huge. And it makes absolutely no sense to say, oh, I'm going to get a virus particle uh, and one virus particle is not gonna make you sick um, from this vast reservoir of air that is this atmosphere. So I'm not sure how many sort of scientifically oriented people really claiming you should wear a mask outside. I think that that's, a, that's more of a kind of a, a public presentation type of thing, you know, wear a mask in solidarity with people who are wearing masks in other places and so on. The whole question of, of wearing masks is a complicated one where certainly I thought, gosh, it's an obviously good idea. Maybe it's a good idea for you, uh, for yourself, oh, I shouldn't be infected. Maybe it's a good idea for other people. Oh, if I'm infected, I shouldn't uh, spread my infection to other people. Turns out the story is a bit more complicated because in a sense, you know, you breathe out, the air that you breathe out has to go somewhere. It's not like the air doesn't get anywhere. And so the question is, you know, does it sort of split out the sides of the mask? Now, if you wear one of these very medical grade, uh, very, you know, contoured to your face type masks, then yes, you can make sure that the air you breathe out is really going through the mask to get to the outside world. But that's more difficult to achieve than one might initially have thought. So again, it's something where you know, people would say scientifically, and, and even I was thinking this, scientifically, it makes sense to wear masks. It's not so obvious that that is as true as one thought it was. Um, but figuring out what's actually true is, is quite difficult. Um, I think that the other, uh, other types of things, well, here's an example of one that's, that's almost a, a, a weird one, a really weird one, um, a recent thing which is the idea that you should you have an event going on and you have people who have gotten vaccines for the, for the 
virus, or maybe have had the virus and so have developed immunity for the virus, you say, let's make two sections of our uh, you know, stadium or something, the vaccinated section and the unvaccinated section. This is just bonkers, I think. I mean, in the sense that as a, as a matter of, oh, you're trying to push people to get vaccinated, well, maybe that's a kind of a way to control people. I think that's a, a kind of a obnoxious thing to, to, to do. But what the thing to realize is the whole idea of herd immunity, that is the virus, okay, how does a virus work? A virus exists by taking over your cells and using the apparatus of your cells to make copies of itself so that the virus can then spread. If the virus simply can't continue to exist unless it can find another host to infect, if it infects you and you develop an immune response and you basically kill all the cells that have virus in them, the virus is you, the virus lost out. It isn't making it from you. So the only way it can continue to survive is by jumping to another host and uh, uh, continuing to replicate in that host's cells. And I think that the, um, uh, that then, so in order for that to happen, that it has to be the case, the virus in sort of can actually make this kind of chain reaction where it goes from you to two people, from two people to, to each to two more people. So that's four people, then to eight people or whatever it is. It has to be able to get from person to person. And in kind of the, the standard theory of epidemiology, there's a, a, a quantity, the R value, it's usually called, which is basically how many people does a given person infect? Now, they only get to infect them when, they're actually, when they've actually got lots of virus in them and they're actually uh, sort of sick and um, uh, with maybe a few little, little things around the edges of that, but that's more or less true. By the time the virus has been sort of, uh, you know, crushed out of that person, there's no virus to go and infect anybody else. So then, so in order for the thing to survive, it's got to jump from host to host to host, person to person to person. If the set of people who are susceptible to the virus is dilute enough because everybody's had it or, they, or, they're, or they've been vaccinated, then the, the virus just does, can't make it. It can't, it, can't, um, uh, it can't jump to enough new hosts to be able to, to survive and, and grow in number. So that's in a sense what you achieve. If you have a collection of people where a large fraction of them have been vaccinated, then even if somebody has the virus, it's like, okay, the virus jumps to another person. Oops, that person's been vaccinated. The virus doesn't make it there. Uh, and, then, and then it's gone. Then, then it can't jump to somewhere else. So in a sense, the, the operation of kind of the herd immunity idea, which is the way that viruses end. I mean, when viruses like flu viruses, other coronaviruses and so on infect humans, what happens is they infect a bunch of humans and sometimes they infect billions of humans around the planet. But what happens is eventually enough people get to be immune to those viruses that the viruses just can't find enough new hosts to infect and the viruses effectively die out. Or close to die out. They, there's usually a small uh, sort of there's small pockets of the virus that get left over, which which is why they can kind of reappear in a subsequent season and things like this. But I think that the um, uh, so you know an idea of um, I'm not sure this is really so much of a science idea of let's you know if you separate the vaccinated and unvaccinated people, so you actually have people where there where you have a group of people where effectively the R value is still large, then those people will actually get sick if there's virus going around. If you put those people in a dilute way among people who are vaccinated who've had the virus, nobody's going to get sick because the virus just can't make it through that, through that kind of uh, forest of, um, of unfriendly hosts, so to speak. I think the, um, uh, another thing which is, um, uh, oh gosh, there's so many things that have gone wrong in this in this pandemic. I think that the the one interesting feature, perhaps, is that if one's interested in virology, epidemiology, immunology, probably the amount of data collected in the last year is probably uh, might even be larger than the whole hundred years before it, in terms of of what we now know. So a good example of um, when we test, we do tests for. Uh, uh, you know, COVID tests, the testing for the amount of, of virus in your nose or whatever else. 
That testing is done using a technique called PCR. Maybe I can explain how PCR works. Um, where what one's doing is, okay, so how does it work? You get this sample of stuff from your nose or whatever. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to find, are there little pieces of DNA, RNA actually, that um, are, are pieces that come from the virus as opposed to pieces that come from you. So, so we have 6 billion base pairs that represents the program for each of us. That's the, that's the size of the genome for a human. This virus has about 29,000 base pairs that represent the program for it. And the question is, if you see a little fragment, a little, little piece of that sequence, the program is the sequence of base pairs, which you can usually represent as letters, A, T, C, G, and so on. So you'll see A, T, 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 C, G, G, A, T, T, whatever. You see some sequence of letters. The question is, is that sequence of letters a piece of the program for us, or is it a piece of the program for the virus? And what one's doing in those tests is to try and identify are there, is the stuff that's in your nose little fragments of things whose programs are the programs for, for the virus? And typically one will be looking for pieces of the virus, like its, its most obnoxious element is its so-called spike protein, but there's also things like its capsid, which is the, the sort of container of the, of the RNA for the virus. And the, these, these have characteristic sort of little programs that make those things. And so what you're doing is you're trying to identify, do you have uh, something in your nose, let's say, that is a program from the virus as opposed to just a program for the cells in your nose? So uh, a program for human versus a program for virus. So how do you tell that? Well, use a technique called PCR. PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. So what you do is you take the cells, take, take the stuff you've got, you kind of break it down and you break out the little pieces, the little molecules. And some of those molecules will be RNA, for example, um, and uh, which is these, these pieces of this program, the sequences, the, the molecule consists of a sequence of different so-called bases, these different sections that contain a few tens of atoms each. And there are four kinds of these bases, four kinds of lumps of tens of atoms. And you're looking at what that sequence uh, aligned on the sort of backbone of the molecule, what that sequence is. Okay, so PCR uses the idea that this thing called polymerase is a thing that will cause one to essentially replicate copies of whatever the program was on some fragment of RNA. And the, the, the idea of, of, of PCR is you go through a series of cycles. And at every cycle, what is a cycle? A cycle is you squirt chemicals in, you heat the thing up and you keep doing that and you cycle through multiple cycles. Every cycle, you're uh, I think doubling the number of copies of the RNA that you have. Okay, so that means whatever RNA is there, you're PCRing it up as people usually say. You're saying um, for this, and, and you, you have a particular template. So you're saying, does this particular uh, does this particular sequence occur here? If it does, double the number of that sequence that occurs. And you keep doing that in a series of cycles. And so what, in order to tell whether you have this virus, you just keep doing it a bunch of times. And then you see by the time you've done it, let's say 40 times, that will be two to the 40th amplification of the number of actual uh, pieces of RNA that are there. And so that means that what started is just like, oh, there was just one or two pieces of RNA in that sample that you got out will end up being this huge amount of that viral RNA, which is then easy to detect. Okay, so one of the things that happened in this whole pandemic story is this question of the cycle count for PCR. That is the number of doublings that you got in sampling whether there was a virus there or not. And so the question is how many uh, how many doublings is the right doubling to use? Because if there's just tons of virus in your nose, you don't need to use very many doublings and you'll immediately be able to detect the presence of virus. On the other hand, if there was just one little tiny piece of you know, viral RNA that was left over in your nose, which is not probably gonna do you much harm, but it just happened to be hanging out there and you use a huge number of cycles, then you'll say, oh, that person is, you know, has the virus in them. So it was a, sort of a big debate. And usually I think 25 cycles is two to the 25 
amplification factor. Um, 25 cycles is a pretty common thing for people to use for various kinds of PCR tests. But for various reasons that are, in some sense, a little bit obscure to me at least, a lot of places started using you know, 40 cycle PCR and so on. So what does that do? Well, that means that, that for example, the, you know, just a little piece of virus that got left over. Let's say, let's say you, you got the thing, it lodged in your nose and then it ends up in the sample. It hasn't actually made you sick. It hasn't actually really started replicating in your body, but it somehow was, was sort of stuck there. Um, then it winds up in this test where you're amplifying 40, you know, 40 fold amplification, two to the 40th amplification. It ends up like, oh yes, that you know you've got a virus. Um, you know this is this is all bad. So I think one of the things that's super confusing is that the people who were genuinely sick with the virus, where that was detected with a small PCR uh, cycle count, there are people where maybe they had been sick three months earlier and there were little fragments of the virus that were left over. Maybe they just had a little virus that landed on their nose and their immune system was going to uh, rebuff it anyway, that were then tagged as being, um, you know, as being sick in that way. So this is a, a very confusing thing. And unfortunately, in a lot of places, uh, well, I, th I think the cycle counts in most places were in some sense, the machines that do these tests do record the cycle count. Whether that data will actually emerge at any point is not clear, because it's quite possibly the case in terms of how this works. You know, I had always taken the point of view, you either get a virus or you don't. You're either sick or you're not. The virus either gets to the point where it's replicating in your body and just making more and more and more millions, billions of copies of itself, and it's giving you all these symptoms and so on, or your immune system is just squashing it and, and killing off uh, all those little, all the cells that get infected with the virus and, and it just never has a chance to take, take root. It's probably the case, and this is a question, you know, what the science community is going to eventually figure out, it's probably the case that there's an intermediate story that in fact, at, you know, that, that one is often getting some amount of virus that makes one not really sick, but sick enough that one's immune system starts going into action and saying, let's get rid of this virus. And by the way, that's not necessarily a bad thing because if it's a subclinical that is not visibly sick infection, so to speak, then quite possibly all that happens is, oh, you get some of this virus. Okay, your immune system says, okay, we better start fighting off this virus. Now let's get primed. So if we ever get more of this virus, we're ready to go and we can immediately rebuff the thing and, um, and get rid of it. So it, it could very well be the case that the typical way that we operate in that sort of our immune system has evolved to operate is that we are expecting to get exposed to just a little bit of lots and lots of viruses and we gradually build up immunity through those little exposures. And only sometimes does the virus manage, we get enough of it or our immune, immune system is, is uh, too naive about how to fight it that the virus ends up replicating enough to actually make us sick. You know, one of the things that I've been curious about, our immune system has the ability to fight off about 100 billion different kinds of sort of patterns of, of, uh, of things like viruses and so on, of, of antigens, of, of uh, things we don't want to have in us. And, and that's, in, the, the, that, that's enough, that's sort of, in a sense, each antigen is represented to our immune system by a sequence of these base pairs of, of what's in its genome. And so this is saying we're recognizing 100 billion different things that we recognize are things that shouldn't be us. And that will cover any possible thing that isn't us will be at least in some approximation covered by that number of uh, possible sort of uh, antibodies that we can form or, or versions of the thing called T-cell receptor that we can produce. But so a question that I think we still don't know the answer to, in, in a typical person, you know, you've been around for a few, few years and you've gotten, you know, exposure to some viruses, some bacteria, things like this, how many of those hundred billion possible antibodies and so on that you might be forming, how many of them have you ever used to mount a defense? And, you know, is it 10? Is it 100? Is it 1,000? Is it a million? I don't think we really know. And that's an important thing to know because it kind of affects uh, things like, oh, questions like, you know, if you had another coronavirus before, so for example, 
a, a common theory now, again, one of these ones which is all steeped in kind of a mixture of science and policy and politics and so on, is you know, one reason why the Pacific Rim countries didn't have as many infections as some other countries in the world is because there was pre-existing immunity in those countries because the SARS-1 virus from, what was it, 10, 15 years ago, had come through and, and, and uh, infected a lot of people in those countries. And it could be the case that the immune system at this 100 billion you know, possible antibodies, that there's enough fuzziness in a particular antibody that's produced um, that the one from the SARS-1, that being immune to SARS-1 is kind of close enough to make you at least somewhat immune to the, the SARS-2 COVID uh, uh, virus. So anyway, I, I think that's some, um, um, these, are, these are things now, uh, you know, the pandemic is a particularly bad case of what is believed scientifically versus what's actually correct, because almost every move that's made in this pandemic has enmeshed itself with kind of public policy and politics and things like this of, look, we don't want to tell people this because then they won't go and get vaccines and we want people to get vaccines. So let's not tell them this. I don't know, I'm, I'm not a big believer in, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a believer as perhaps these, these very um, uh, live streams might indicate, I'm a believer that people can actually understand stuff and that sort of not telling people things is bad. Um, and that people are, you know, I think there's sort of a, there's, a, there's always a trade-off because if you say to people, and this is a, you know, a trade-off for people who run governments and things like this, is how much do you tell people? You know, in other words, if you, because if you start, if you tell people a whole bunch of science, you say everybody should make their own decision about whether this is a safe drug or not a safe drug, here's the data. It's, you know, we've got, uh, you know, a megabyte of data, all go out and figure out whether this drug is safe and everybody choose for yourself. Well, people will be hard pressed to do that. It's just, it's not something most people are expert at doing. On the other hand, you can say, you know, that um, don't understand this. We're just gonna tell you that even if you got a vaccine, you're still, you still have the potential to be infectious, which I don't think anybody seriously scientifically believes. But we're just gonna tell you that because it will affect behavior in a way that will lead to a better outcome. You know, that, that's a different model. And it's something where I think the, um, uh, the question of what, um, uh, you know, how do you, how do you tell people enough that they can make the right decisions um, both for themselves and potentially for society in general, and, and not so much that they're just confused and don't know what to decide and potentially end up concluding something that's, that's in fact completely wacky. So in any case, I think that the, um, oh gosh, I could just go on and on and on about the pandemic and about the different therapies for which, which have been, uh, you know, where people have just sort of ignored the fact that these therapies actually probably work, but no therapy works all the time for any disease. So saying, does it always work, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We could talk about um, oh, just, just all kinds of things that um, uh, it's, been a, it's been a bad time for the interaction of science because the science really matters. And uh, yet people are, are kind of, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's been very confusing because for, for a couple of reasons. One of them is there's science we just don't know. There's a lot that we just don't know about epidemiology, the, the spreading of diseases, about immunology, the way that our immune system attacks disease. There's a lot we do know, but there's also a lot we don't know. And some of the things that have been really important questions in this pandemic are things we just don't happen to know the answer to. Some of them I think are intrinsically hard to answer for very sort of deep scientific reasons. Some of them are just like, we just don't happen to know that about the immune system. You know, it's a, it's a famous question. Flu tends to be worse in the winter, better in the summer. As in, well, people, more people get sick in the winter than in the summer. Nobody knows why. That's been a, a long time question of, of, is it, it's just, there are theories, but they're not particularly good. Um, it's just a big mystery. And, you know, eventually we'll know the answer to that, but we don't know it yet. And, and things like that being unknown gives one, it, that plays into all of these uncertainties about, about immunology and so on. Um, let's see. Um, I'm, there's a couple of questions about viruses. 
Uh, let me try and address those and then we'll go on to some other different topics. Motu asks, can a virus mutate and replicate again and again in your body while the immune system is fighting it? So that every time the immune system figures out one form and kills it, there's already a new form uh, replicating, a kind of viral cat and mouse game. Well, in terms of viruses, I, well, okay, let, let me say there is a case where that happens in one's body and it's kind of a, an unfortunate case, which is with cancer and tumors because a, a tumor is basically something is cells that have a genetic code that's different from your genetic code, but similar enough to your genetic code that usually the immune system doesn't say, hey, this is a bad thing, I'm gonna get rid of it. And what can happen is, particularly when you use drugs to attack the, the cancer, um, you'll, you'll end up finding out that you any cancer that has this feature, you kill it off. But as you're getting billions, even trillions of cells that are progressively replicating, um, as at each replication, there's a certain chance that you get a random mutation that gives you a different genetics for the next cell. And the bad thing that can happen is, kind of a, a sped up version of natural selection where the any, any tumor cell that has this characteristic, oops, the drug is just gonna kill it. But then a tumor cell develops by mutation that isn't killed by that drug. And so then it's, it sort of continues and it divides into more cells and it divides and so on. And then that mutation ends up being one that evolves and evades those drugs. And that's one of the reasons why in, in, in cancer therapy, it's very common to use many drugs because you're kind of, let's, let's cut off this line of attack, this way that the, the thing could mutate and attack us. Let's cut off this one. And sometimes kind of a, a modern technique involves, let's predict what it might do next, what mutation it might have next, and let's block that exit um, before it even can start in that direction. So the, the idea of mutations, progressive mutations in one's body, is kind of the, the you know, what, what tends to happen in, in the case of tumors. Now, the, the, the bad feature of tumors is that our immune systems don't fight them because they don't, they're, because they're so, they're sufficiently similar to our own genetic setup that they're not recognized as foreign things. One of the big things that people try to do is so-called immunotherapy for cancer. It's something people have been talking about for a hundred years, um, but it's something that is progressively looks more and more promising. And in fact, the technology that led to the uh, mRNA vaccines that um, uh, are being used for, for COVID, the, the um, Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, that technology was developed for the purpose of, pro of doing immunotherapy for, for tumors, for being able to say, here's a tumor, here's the genetics that it has in it. Let's invent essentially a vaccine that specifically attacks things that have that genetics. And then let's inject that into somebody and then their immune system will mount an attack on what is in fact in that case, not a virus, but a, a tumor cell. And so, for example, when the vaccines were developed at the beginning of this pandemic, what happened is everybody was, was kind of ready there to just say, oh, you know, somebody has a tumor with this particular genetic sequence, let's program up a, a, a vaccine, a custom vaccine for that particular genetic sequence. Everybody was ready to do that. So when a virus came in, it's like, well, let's program up a vaccine that attacks this virus rather than attacking, for example, the thing that's in a tumor cell. Now, the question of whether a virus can mutate in a person, the answer is I think the mutation rate is way too low for there to be a, a multiple mutations kind of story. Um, at best, you know, you see these trees of mutations and it's kind of like the, the tree of life. There's progressive mutations of this virus. And I think, oh gosh, what is the mutation rate? Um, I think it's like, hmm. I think in a single person, the average time between mutations would be years, many years. And, um, and, and so given that it only infects a person for a, a small number of days, typically, the chance of a mutation among the, so, so that means that of among the replications that are happening for, um, uh, of that virus in you, there are not enough replications that the chance of an error, the chance of a mutation 
is small enough that the that while it's infecting you in particular, it's unlikely that there'll be more than at most maybe one mutation, and and more to the more likely one millionth of a mutation. Like it has to infect lots of people before there's a mutation. Um, so that's so I, I don't think I don't think we'll we'll see that in a in a single human. Uh, in the population, that's a different story. Let's see. Uh, Alex is asking, is there more low-hanging fruit to be collected in biology? It feels like the smartest people choose to study physics and math. I wonder if more should go into biology. You know, that's changed over time. As different fields become more popular, less popular. You know, when I was younger, physics was the top dog, you know, the, the, the best the, the sort of the, the best and brightest type field. It's changed. I mean, you know, it's been computer science, it's been machine learning, it's been neuroscience, and it's been lots of biology. Um, I think that the rate of advance in biology in the last like few decades has been far, you know, vastly greater than it has been at any other time in history, because there are new methods that have become available, there's new understanding. It's really a, a kind of golden age for the development of biology. But biology is hard. I mean, we're trying to understand, you know, this sort of random series of events that took place throughout the three billion years or so of the history of life on Earth. And it's difficult to sort of understand all of that historically generated stuff. Um, but I think that uh, there's, there's, a, there's a good number of, of, um, uh, of, of uh, sort of um, people who go into biology. Now, what tends to happen is one of the questions about biology is does one get to use all that physics and math and computer science expertise in biology or not? Because, you know, physics is a very theory-based field. You know, we actually do theoretical physics and we think it, it is, we're able to make models of how the physical world works. We're able to make predictions and so on. In biology, there's a tremendous tendency to just say, oh, it's too difficult. There can't be a theory. Let's just do experiments and measure what happens and just say, oh, this drug is, you know, 82% um, uh, successful. We don't really know why. That's just the number and it comes from an experiment. And so I think one of the things that is, has the potential to happen is really a flowering of more theoretically oriented biology. I think the immune system is a great example that, um, uh, of, um, of a place where I think there's a need for a, a sort of a new theoretical paradigm uh, to understand what's going on. In fact, I, I have a slight suspicion that some of the things we've learned from our physics project and the kind of paradigm for distributed computation that's happened in the physics project may actually be relevant to understanding things like the immune system. Um, but they're, they're a place where it could do with more physics and math type thinking. Um, uh, you know, experiments are, go uh, are great, but at some point, you know, a million experiments can't make up for not understanding the big picture of what's happening, because you just don't know which experiment to do if you don't have a bigger theory about what's going on. And um, yeah, Parmenides is mentioning Paul Allen's big neurobiology project. Yeah, there, there's, a, there's a bunch of projects to um, uh, the, sort of understand the brain, whatever that means, that's been a popular area. Neuroscience has been a particularly popular area. Um, it's not, to me, uh, so completely clear what some of the objectives are there, because it's, yes, there's, there's what, what, what we're seeing is artificial neural networks, which were kind of conceptually related to our brain's work back in the 1940s, artificial neural networks that turn into machine learning and artificial intelligence and so on. A huge amount has been done with those in the last decade. And lots of tasks that we used to think were sort of humans only, like recognizing this is a bird versus this is an elephant or something. Those used to be very difficult to get a computer to do. They're now tolerably easy to get a computer to do at a level of, of uh, success that's similar to what humans can do. And that's something where we've understood from this kind of idealization of things about how brains work, but it's a very much of an idealization that yes, we can do that. Now the question is how does it actually work in an actual brain? And the same principles seem to apply, but the details are, are somewhat different. And it's, it's a little bit unclear to me what we will learn from sort of more detailed understanding about how brains work. I mean, maybe we will get, uh, as we did in the case of artificial neural nets, we got sort of a hint about how we could build a computational system. But it's worth remembering that that hint took between 1943 and 2011 to really catch on. In other words, it took 
you know, a solid, what is it, um, 70 years or something to, um, uh, to really uh, actually go from the hint from biology to the practice of computation. And so it's, it's not clear, you know, if we learn some particular thing about some, this is a really nifty trick that brains use that was learned from evolution, it's unclear how quickly we can deploy that in, in technology, for example. And if we want to know things like, well, how do we, how do we for example, connect to brains? You know, how do we make a, a direct connection between the electronics that we have and brains? That's something there's a bunch of efforts to do that right now. So you've got to remember, nerves in our brain, the 100 billion nerve cells in our brain, they're all operating electrically. They're all a thousand times a second or something. They're making their little pulse of electricity that is the thing that is the actual stuff that is what our thoughts are made of, so to speak. And so the thing that one thinks about doing is, can one, for example, detect uh, from those 100 billion nerve cells, can you detect sort of individual little spikes of electrical activity and record and, and figure out sort of what thinking is going on on the basis of that. Our EEG, our electroencephalogram, our brain waves, um, you know, where you just have a, a 12 leads or something of these big electrodes connected to your, your head or something like that, they are a very, very coarse uh, version of sort of recording that electrical activity in your brain. Instead of recording from individual neurons, they're recording from clumps. Of, of millions or billions of neurons, and they're recording just large scale features of the electrical activity in the brain. But one of the things that one would like to do if one wants to understand sort of more precisely what's the brain thinking about is to record individual, uh, the activity of individual nerve cells. And um, the, uh, uh, the thing that, um, uh, so, you know, in, in the case of uh, the giant axon of the squid, which is a very big, uh, nerve cell is very easy to record from a single nerve cell in that case in a squid. In us humans, it's, um, uh, it, well, it, it's difficult to get access to the, the brain, but, but even so, it's quite difficult to record, although possible to record from single neurons. The thing that's kind of the state of the art of technology now is a little array that's like a, like a chip, like a microprocessor chip, except that it's something that you, know, you have to put inside and you put it sort of on the surface of the brain, and then you can, it has an array where it might record from a thousand different neurons that are nearby. Now, you only get to record on the surface. One of the things that I think is sort of the test of that technology that I've been kind of waiting for since I was a kid is the type by thought type technology. You know, right now, if you type something, what's happening? Your brain is thinking, I'm going to type a, an S or something. And then, you know, that the, the signal is being generated in your brain. Uh, in the end, it, it ends up, uh, in the motor strip, which is a piece of um, a piece of your brain that's about there, I think um, it's uh, uh, what happens is neurons in the motor strip start becoming active, start producing little spikes of electricity, and then they transmit those spikes of electricity to nerves that go through your spinal cord and eventually actually end up being the nerve that excites the muscle in your finger and makes you type that key. Now you might say oh, there's an extra uh, tenth of a second that is all this messing around of sending the nerve signal all the way down your arm and to your finger and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Let's just pick it up right in the motor strip and let's not have to move any fingers. You just think about typing an S and um, you can then type the S. So it's been kind of a long running story. Back in the 1960s, even before that, there were experiments done on sort of uh, actuate by thought, so to speak. And it was particularly done for, for military pilots, for example, where it's like, uh, you know, you're in some kind of, uh, uh, you know, highly tense dogfight with another plane. And um, it's like, can you react quickly? If you can reduce the reaction time by a hundred, by, by a tenth of a second, um, you're, you know, that, that's a big deal. And so there were experiments done with, you know, fighter pilots and so on, where, where they're, like measuring the brain waves and such like to try and do that. Of course, it's a little bit tricky because the question of, you know, did you really mean to press that button to fire that missile? Well, it's one thing to get to the point where you really decide you're gonna do it and you move your finger and you press the button. It's another to say, let's record that, uh, that slight beginnings of a thought somewhere in your brain that might turn into you deciding to press the button. 
Now, of course, it could be the case that even recording the beginnings of the thought, it's like, okay, let's power up that particular piece of equipment so that it's ready if in fact the person decides a tenth of a second later, yes, they really meant that, go ahead and press that button. Then it's sort of, you know, it's primed to be ready to do its thing. But anyway, it's been sort of a long running story. Will you be able to type by thought? Um, I had always thought when I was a kid, I, I always thought you got to attach all those icky electrodes with all that weird jelly stuff to your head. And it's, it's like, uh, you know, if your hair falls out, it's easier to do that. Turns out it isn't actually difficult to attach those, even when you've got, uh, you know, all your healthy, um, you know, head of hair, so to speak. So it wasn't really a, a, a big feature there, but it's, it's still, we're still not there yet. The type by thought thing is still not there. It's certainly of interest to people who, uh, you know, are paralyzed in some way, um, who, who can't, uh, then it becomes very interesting to pick up those, those nerve impulses because that's, then you can kind of, you know, move a cursor around on a screen, things like that, just by thought without having to actually move an arm if you can't move your arm. Um, and, and similarly, uh, you know, being able to pick up signals, not from the brain, but from the spinal cord and being able to use that to move legs and things like that without having to actually use the, if the, if the nerves, if you don't have working nerves that let you do that yourself, having connecting that to electronics is a good thing. And one of the things that's happened more recently is using machine learning to say, okay, we've got this array of, that we're able to pick up data from a bunch of nerve cells, what does that mean? Does that particular pattern of excitation of these particular nerves, does that mean you're trying to move the cursor to the left? Well, you've either, either you've got to learn how to produce the right pattern of electrical stimulation, electrical effects in your brain to do that, or something has got to learn from you what you meant by that. And kind of a, a, a sort of symbiosis of those two things, a, a merger of those things is probably the most likely to work. I mean, after all, when we learn, you know, how to move our fingers to type or something, we are learning what is it, what is this pattern of electrical stimulation in our brain that causes us to type the word T-H-E or something like this. That's what we're learning. We're learning how to do that. And, and the fact that that's learning how we actually produce electrical signals that move our actual fingers, we could as well um, have uh, be doing that to uh, to move some piece of electronics that's connected to us. So that's sort of an, an application for kind of the neuroscience uh, ideas. There's also the question of can we feed data into our brain? Could we have something where you know you don't have to uh, actually look at that text message that's coming in? It could be just directly played into your brain, um, or you could have something where you are uh, your your um, uh, you know, you don't even have to go typing on a computer, I want to know this. You don't have to ask Wolf Mao for some question. It's kind of just built in, and it's as if it's in your own personal memory. Well, the fact is, the, the, uh, for example, with our eyes, the rate at which we can get data into our brains through our eyes is really very good. I mean, it's, it's um, you know, uh, well, it's at least, what is it, uh, 100 megabytes per second or something. Um, is the is the kind of on that order? It's it's a lot of data that we're getting in from just seeing things through our eyes. So it's going to be it's a lot of effort of electronics to make that thing that's sort of an array of electrodes that will somehow inject that kind of data into your brain. Now, for example, if your eyes aren't functioning, then being able to inject that data directly into the visual cortex at the back of our heads, where where the data goes from our eyes, that can be useful to do that electronically. But as a way of sort of getting a higher bandwidth communication channel with the world, I think that's a, that's a challenging thing to achieve there. Of course, you know, the ultimate thing one, one thinks about is to what extent can we outsource the activities of our brain to say, oh, I don't want to do that piece of arithmetic myself. I'll just get my, the machine that's connected to my brain to do it. So somebody asks you, you know, what's seven times eight? And it's like, instead of remembering that in your own brain, it's being remembered or computed in this sort of ancillary brain that is a computer connected to your brain. And maybe that happens in a way where you don't even realize that it's not in your brain that that computation is going on. To you, it feels like I just know the answer. It's connected to my brain. Is that going to be something that's going to work? Um, potentially, yes, at some point in the future. Um, I think it will be an interesting feeling, but the thing to realize is outsourcing things to machines 
is something we're in a very good position to do right now. I mean, in my life, I've spent lots of effort building our full-scale computational language, our Wolfram language system, whose main objective is to be able to take the things that we think about, be able to let us communicate by sort of typing them into a computer and then outsource the computation that has to be done or the finding that knowledge to and, or computing that knowledge to the computer and then using our eyes to bring it back. And, and for me, for example, particularly, I tend to uh, store a lot, of, a, a lot of information about my life, a lot of sort of personal analytics data I have, you know, every piece of email I've, I've sent and received for the last 30 something years. And, you know, most of the keystrokes I've typed for, for a very large number of years and all kinds of other data like that. And so for me, I'm in a sense outsourcing my human memory to my machine. And when I want to know, oh, I have, a, have I thought about that before? Well, I, you know, I can use my own human memory to try and remember that. But also I, I have a decent human memory, I think. But, um, uh, the, the, but also I've got this outsourced memory in my computer that allows me to just sort of supercharge what I can actually remember for myself. So I think that that sort of symbiosis is something that can already easily happen by virtue of having the right tools to interact with computers without having something that's sort of directly attached to the brain. Okay, well, let's see. Um, oh, actually, this is a good question from Nick here. What techniques do I use to, to remember information when studying all these, all these kinds of fields that I, that I study? I don't think I have any systematic technique for remembering things. I think anytime I kind of think to myself, I'm gonna memorize this thing. Um, you know, I guess when I was a kid, I did that a bit. And, and uh, you know, it turned out I just have a pretty good memory. So all these tricks for, let me remember this, let me come up with a mnemonic, didn't really add up to much. Um, the, uh, the main way to understand things is to know everything around them, so to speak. And to also have a, the, the way to remember things is to actually understand them deeply enough that you can kind of reconstruct what there is from kind of fragments, so to speak, that you understand why it works that way. So it isn't just a random fact, this or that, but it somehow fits into this pattern that allows you to kind of reconstruct, recover that fact just from sort of the engram of things around it without having to say, oh yeah, I remember that specific thing. Um, you know, I think that as I've learned more different fields, you know, I see many, many parallels and correspondences and how, oh, this is just like this thing I learned over here. I mean, there's, there's lots of knowledge in the world, but there's also lots of patterns of how that knowledge works. And there's lots that are shared between different fields and kind of learning those patterns by learning any field deeply enough and then saying, hey, wait a minute, haven't I seen that kind of thing before? Um, you know, this comes from, this is just like what happens in this place. That to me is, is sort of the best way to remember things. And as I say, having a deep enough knowledge of how things work, that even if you forget a piece over here, it's easy to fill that in because you know what the big picture of how it's all generated is. Let's see. Another question here from, um, uh, from Nick. Do I have opinions about why Mars One failed? I didn't know they'd actually definitively failed. Okay, so it was an effort, slightly bizarre effort for people to take a one-way trip to Mars to become colonists of the planet Mars. Um, you know, I think it's a certain kind of person that says, hey, you know, I'm okay just going off to this place where I'm never gonna come back from. Obviously in human history, that's happened plenty of times. People have gone off to colonize a new world of some kind and uh, without a serious expectation that they're going to go back. Um, and that's something that's happened. I'm not sure that in today's world with all of the expectations of communication and travel and so on, that that's as attractive an opportunity. But um, I think the primary thing, if you want to colonize Mars, the first thing you have to do is get to Mars. And then you have to prove that you can actually have a self-sustaining colony, you know, I think that there was the experiment of, you know, the Biosphere 2 experiment, for example, of trying to have this, this closed uh, ecosystem that now ends up as this sort of monument to that in near Tucson, Arizona, um, that uh, uh, was sort of an effort to put a bunch of plants and some people and things 
into the sort of sealed dome and just say, okay, pretend you're on Mars, how does it work out? And there were lots of problems in getting that to work out. So it's sort of a little bit of an unsolved problem, how you make a, an Earth-like ecosystem that is a separate, small sort of Earth-like ecosystem. You know, we have the whole Earth to, uh, for our ecosystem to play out in with lots of big trees and oceans and, and uh, uh, you know, air currents and all kinds of things. If you're doing that in a little dome on Mars where the atmosphere is vastly thinner than it is on Earth, um, it's, a, it's a different story. Of course, then we get into questions like, can we terraform Mars or Venus for that matter? Can we turn those planets into something where you have something like an atmosphere similar to the Earth? I mean, there's sort of a theory, I have no idea whether it's really correct, that if you blow up the ice caps of Mars, which have lots of water in them, they have lots of, uh, of ice in them, um, if, you, if you blow them up with, with enough nuclear explosions and so on, you can throw enough water vapor up into the atmosphere of Mars that you can potentially make something that's more like an Earth-like atmosphere. I'm not sure if that's really a true theory. There's also been a persistent theory for decades that on Venus, you know, Mars has a very thin atmosphere. Venus has a pretty thick atmosphere and it's very, very hot on the surface. You know, spacecraft that land on the surface of Venus have survived for at most like 15 minutes before just like basically melting. Um, so the, the question of Venus is, can you sort of make the atmosphere thinner? And so there are theories about, uh, you know, seeding bacteria in the clouds of Venus to try and um, uh, make it so that it will, that will change the atmosphere of Venus and, um, uh, and make it a, uh, an Earth-like livable planet. We have to then ask, I mean, there's a certain question of sort of uh, ultimate planetary environmentalism, so to speak, um, and uh, and it's sort of a it's a complicated planetary ethics question, I suppose. Um, you know, do you say, okay, it's fine, Venus is the way it is right now. Uh, you know, let's just make it Earth-like because that's what we want to do, and and you know maybe that's a good thing to do. Um, but uh, there are obviously uh, lots of complicated um, arguments to be had about well, what if there was a form of life that existed on Venus and it. We don't really know how to detect it yet, but in 50 years, we'll understand what it is. And then we'll be like, oh my gosh, we just destroyed all of that. Does that matter? Does it not matter? It's like we have a virus that's been attacking us for the past year and a bit. You know, we would like to make it extinct. You know, we have to ask ourselves, is that, um, uh, you know, I think, I think most people would agree that's a pretty good deal for humans to make that virus extinct. You know, how does that compare to the, the creatures of Venus, if there are any? probably microorganisms if there were anything, which there probably aren't, um, not life in the form that we are used to life on Earth. Well, let's see, maybe one or two more questions. And then, um, uh, let's see. Oh boy, somebody asked the question, why does the universe exist? Which I have been working on. I, I wrote a piece about that. I'm not gonna dive into that here, maybe another time. That is not a five minute answer. Um, let's see. Um, well, there's a, a couple here which I can answer somewhat quickly. There's one from Coin asking, gravity is a force that pulls things in, not a force that pushes things. Dark matter, which is the sort of mysterious uh, matter in the universe that is a force that's pulling things, but we don't know what it is that's pulling. Could that be somehow uh, the result, its effects be like a shielding of this sort of, um, uh, oh, I see, some, some, something where there's sort of a, 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 a pushing force as well as a pulling force associated with gravity. Actually, that's exactly what dark energy is supposed to be. Ordinary gravity pulls things together the formulas for, that describe gravity and that we actually, we can reproduce in our model of physics um, are say, if you have a lump of mass, if you have this thing that has a mass, it will exert a gravity and that gravity will pull things in. But if that mass was negative, if it was, you know, usually you have a thing, it, it has a, a certain weight, it, it's, it's, it's being pulled by gravity. But if the mass was negative, it would be, the gravity it produces and the way that it will be pulled by gravity would be the opposite. And it would be repelled by gravity. It would push things away. 
So, so there is sort of an idea that there can be negative mass stuff, which is dark energy. In our models of physics, there is sort of the equivalent of that because in a sense throughout space, there's a certain amount of activity which is necessary to kind of knit together the structure of space. And that activity, an excess of that activity is what leads to the presence of energy or mass. And so if there's less than usual activity in space, it leads to the equivalent of negative mass and so on. Um, let's see. There was a question here from Riff. If time stops in a black hole, does that mean all matter in a black hole stops aging? Yes. I mean, what happens in a black hole in an ordinary, in a simplest kind of black hole that isn't spinning around is at the center of the black hole, there's a singularity in space time that has the feature that time just stops. It's as if, so what is that like? For a thing that is experiencing that, well, there are big gravitational forces, so the thing might be torn apart. But if you can, if you can ignore that and just say, what does it feel as it's going to this space-like singularity, as it's called, this place where time just stops? What does it feel like to have time stop? Well, it's like, imagine you were an AI and you were operating on a computer and somebody switches off the computer. Time is stopping for you. But... The, the things are going on in the outside world, but for you, time has just stopped. No time passes. And so you don't get to ponder the fact that, oh, this is very nice. I'm not aging anymore because time has stopped. You don't get to do anything. No thoughts occur. So if for the, it's, it's like you're just frozen and, and there, is, there is nothing, uh, it, it's, it's like time is not passing. Time has stopped you don't get to ponder the fact that, gosh, I'm so lucky, I've stopped aging, time has stopped because nothing, you don't get to think about that, so to speak. Now, from the outside world, yes, it can look to be from the outside world, it's like, gosh, that thing is very lucky, it's not aging anymore, time is not passing for that thing. That's what happens even at the, at the outside, at the event horizon of a black hole, things, that um, to somebody far away from the black hole, it looks as if that thing, that clock that was going, and you see the clock ticking, 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 as it gets close to the event horizon of a black hole, it will stop ticking. It will just become frozen there. It, its time will be frozen. Its position will be frozen. If you were in the clock, the clock has a different perception of time. And for the clock, it's just falling through this event horizon and continuing going tick tock, tick tock, until it gets to this singularity in the black hole, at which point it just stops. But it can't detect that it's stopped because everything that it might use to detect what's happening has also stopped. Let's see. Well, um, Maybe one or two more here. Gosh, there's, there's a lot of interesting questions here. Um, all right, there's one here. I'll do two more. Okay, there's one from Markup. Why do we need to supercool materials for superconductors or quantum systems Why can't we drive them mechanically at a set frequency to cool them preferentially in one direction? Okay, what does it mean? What is temperature? Temperature, when we make something hotter, what's happening is we're making all the molecules in that thing whiz around faster. So when we cool things down, the molecules are going slower and slower and slower. There's a direct relationship between temperature and the speed that those molecules are going at. So often those molecules will have forces between them and those forces will sometimes be so strong that they don't allow the molecules to whiz around much. And that's when you get a solid and things like this. So the question is, how do you cool stuff down? And the, the most common ways to cool things down have to do with the fact that when you have, okay, so, so what's making those molecules whiz around is energy. And 
what you're doing is when you cool things down, a very common thing is to say, let's keep the same amount of energy in this box of gas, but let's somehow have that energy be distributed in such a way that every molecule gets less of it. And so that, that means that the, the, amount, the, the amount of energy associated with the motion of those molecules will go down. And so there are a whole variety of techniques for cooling things down. In the end, you have to use another effect as well, which is um, you tend to have to use the effect that molecules tend to attract each other. And so as you, uh, you can kind of trade off energy of motion for energy that's associated with the attraction between molecules. And that's a standard technique that is used when you are cooling down um, something like, let's say cooling down air to make it eventually liquid, um, that you're using that, um, uh, that effect of, uh, of the fact that there's a, a force of attraction between molecules. You're kind of using that to slow down the molecules to make them effectively have a lower temperature. But you're also using, in many cases, just the pure process of expanding gases, cooling them down. The gas laws say pressure times volume equals a constant times temperature. And so by changing pressure and volume, you can change temperature and so on. But there's, there's other techniques um, for making things very cold. There's a technique that's used to reach down to, uh, so, so when you make something colder, eventually it's as cold as it can be because temperature is the rate at which all these molecules are whizzing around. But eventually when you make it cold enough, that corresponds to the molecules effectively having stopped. Because of effects in quantum mechanics, there are zero point fluctuations. They don't actually stop, but they in a sense get as slow as they can ever get. And, and that's and the, the temperature at which they get as slow as they can ever get is what's called absolute zero, minus 273.16, et cetera, degrees centigrade. That's the temperature at which kind of there's no more you, you've made everything as cold as it can be. Now, as you reach down to uh, th that, that temperature is also called zero kelvins. Um, that's, the, that's the other. And so then our ordinary room temperature would be, you know, 293 kelvins um, or 20 degrees centigrade or whatever. Um, the, uh, so at zero kelvins, one talks about cooling things down to milli kelvins or micro kelvins. That's within a thousandth or a millionth of um, the uh, of, of degrees centigrade of absolute zero. And there are techniques that get used in that end part of cooling. There's a thing called um, uh, adiabatic demagnetization. Um, and those techniques kind of mess around with the, the detailed alignment of atoms and the detailed way that atomic spins line up and so on. And so when you're asking about cooling things down by sort of uh, sending everything to go in one direction. Those are kinds of techniques that are a little bit closer to what's done when you're cooling things very, very close to absolute zero. Um, and uh, the, the sort of the question of, of, you know, in a sense, how would you cool things down? Well, one way to cool things down would be to have a very molecular scale computer, let's say, and to have it be the case that it's, you know, it's in this box of gas Every time it seems a gas molecule is going fast, it says, oh, you're going above the speed limit. I'm going to stop you, or I'm going to turn you, you know, do so, tweak you in some way. And gradually, sort of molecule by molecule, slow the molecules down. Maybe you're going to say, you're going too fast in that direction. Let me, let me tweak you a little bit so that you're going to collide with another molecule that's going fast in the other direction. Then you'll both, you'll both maybe bounce off at a slightly slower speed or something like this. You know, doing the molecule by molecule cooling down of, of the system. That kind of technique, sometimes called Maxwell's demon, is kind of a way of doing that sort of molecular scale cooling down. It's thought of as kind of a thought experiment, not as something you can actually do. And as a matter of fact, some of the reasons that, that gases work the way they do is because we're not doing things like that. If we did things like that, and that was routinely happening, we would see gases behave in different ways than they normally behave. But that's sort of where you can imagine if you could construct such a system with fine enough computational and, and uh, sensors and actuators and so on, you could cool a gas down by doing that kind of molecule by molecule uh, kind, of, kind of work. Okay, final question for today. Varun asks, what's the difference between science and technology and how do they complement each other? This is one of these, I think that's an easy question, but now I'm going to realize that I'm descending into a, uh, a giant rabbit hole. Uh, 
really the story of science is it's about understanding the world as the world is. The story of technology is taking the world as it is and essentially tweaking it or identifying pieces of it that we can use to achieve particular human purposes. So when we say, what's a kind of scientific understanding of, I don't know, uh, the flow of a fluid, the flow of water, that's all about, can we, if we see water flowing in this way, can we understand what it's doing? Can we predict what it's going to do? Things like this. That's the role of science. The role of technology is, given that we have water flow and we know certain things about how it works, if we put paddles in the water in this way and that way, what consequence will that have? Will that allow us to make a, uh, you know, a mill or something, that, that a, a water mill um, or something like this from the water? In other words, can we take that, that, that thing that exists in the physical world and can we apply it for our particular purposes to achieve our particular ends? And sometimes when we do technology, we don't need to understand how the system works. We just say, yep, we've got the technology that if um, water flows quickly in this direction, we can use it to, to turn this wheel that we can use to grind wheat or something. And, um, uh, th then, and that's enough. We don't need to know how the water flow works. We just need to know that we can kind of uh, uh, insert ourselves into that to make something that is technologically useful. Whereas in science, it's like, well, how does that work? Can we explain? Can we describe? Can we kind of tell a story about how the water is operating? Um, even if what we learn is that, well, the water does all these complicated things. We don't know why we care in the sense that it's very interesting and intellectually uh, worth knowing, but it isn't something where we can say, well, given that we know it works this way, we can then immediately use it for some human purpose. Now, it's a, it's a big trade-off for example, in the world of machine learning, where we have all of these different techniques that say, we can identify that was, uh, you know, we can recognize this is a kind of cell that's gonna do this, and that's one that's gonna do this. And we can do it just by looking at the microscopic pictures of the cells and just saying, there's all these features of these microscopic pictures, and this machine learning system is gonna pick out the ones it needs to say, is the cell gonna do this or that? But that isn't science in a sense, because in a sense, what that's doing is we don't really know how that works. There's no narrative about how that works. It's just what well, we feed it into this machine learning system and it just figures out, oh, it works this way rather than that way. Much as we as humans might have learnt, oh, that thing is gonna do this, that thing is gonna do that without being able to tell a more detailed story, a more detailed scientific story about what's going on. Now, often there's sort of a feedback loop between these things because yes, we can just uh, use the machine learning system. We don't really know how it works, but it's gonna distinguish this cell from that cell, but then we can leverage that. We can build on that to do something that is more scientific in the sense that it's more sort of telling a story about what's going to happen. Now, one place where technology, uh, sometimes one the sort of mixed situations, like for example, if you look at programs, most of the time we're writing programs explicitly. We write every line of computational language, every line of code, we're just writing that. Um, and uh, we're not um, doing something where um, uh, um, the, um, uh, where, so we're constructing something for our particular human purpose. One of the things that has been something I've been very involved in um, is kind of just searching the computational universe of possible programs just as we look around the world to sort of scientifically identify, oh, there's this magnetic material, that's cool, it works this way. And then we can ingest that as something that we use for technology. We make these things that use magnetism to work. Doing the same kind of thing for the computational universe, understanding enough of the science of what's out there in the computational universe that we can see what things to pull in for the purpose of making technology. So that's, that's a few thoughts on the sort of difference between science and technology. An interesting question is whether they're both sort of endless frontiers. Is there an infinite number of things that can be invented? I think it's very easy to see that the answer to that is going to be yes. There are an infinite number of things that can be invented. The only question is whether you care about every one of those inventions. What defines what inventions we care about? In terms of science, are there an infinite number of things that can potentially be explained? My guess is the answer is yes but that's a slightly less obvious question. And it relies on this phenomenon of computational reducibility and pockets of computational reducibility, things which I've understood uh, in the context of my kind of uh, 
uh, science of the computational universe and more recently understanding fundamental physics, I've understood more about the sense in which there can be sort of an infinite number of possible different types of understanding that you can have of the universe. And in that sense, science is inevitably uh, an endless frontier as technology is an endless frontier of all the different things that one can invent that can operate in our universe. All right, well, I think I should wrap up here for now. Um, and uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, see you another time.